Many historians and archaeologists fixate on cultures from what they consider civilized or cultured parts of the world. This often means obsession with Western Europe and East and Central Asian cultures. However, there have been many advanced cultures worldwide for long periods of time. Many try to understand the world around them, like the Greeks, and like we have, but left behind very little to prove it. Evidence from a ton of Mayan sites across Mexico show that these people were actively trying to understand nature, and specifically the creatures of the ocean and past oceans. There is a story to tell here about how the Mayans interacted with modern sharks as well as one of the largest fish and the largest shark to ever live, Megalodon. many different peoples, nation-states, civilizations, and ethnicities throughout the uber-long history of human settlement of the Americas. The Aztecs were a Mesoamerican culture from 1300 to 1521 from central Mexico. The Incan Empire was the largest empire in pre-Columbian America from the early 13th century to 1572 across the western sliver of South America and the Mayans were a Mesoamerican civilization developed by a bunch of different ethnicities that inhabited a certain region of Central America from 2000 BC, with the last Maya city falling in 1697 to the Spanish Empire. Go figure. The Maya people obviously survived the destruction of their cities and live in the same region to this day. I'm not an archaeologist, so obviously all of this stuff is more complicated than I'm letting on, but for the sake of where I'm going with this, assume that's it. The Maya area within Mesoamerica included what is now southeastern Mexico, all of Guatemala and Belize, and the western portions of Honduras and El Salvador. It includes the northern lowlands of the Yucatan Peninsula and the highlands of the Sierra Madre, the Mexican state of Chiapas, southern Guatemala, El Salvador, and the southern lowlands of the Pacific Littoral Plain. This big old chunk right here. Despite much discussion and coverage of the ancient Greek attempts to understand and describe the natural world, uh, both of the fantastical and the mundane, many other civilizations did the same. The issue is that a lot of them did not leave behind the same kind of hard proof that they did it. But if one group of people tried it, most probably did too. In the case of the Mayans, the tropical jungles, highlands, and waterways encompassed an enormous biodiversity that absolutely required rational and mythical explanations by the endemic human population. Here, sharks are represented at many coastal Mayan cities, like Xcambo, Cozumel, Chalchuapa, and the like. Shark bits are also found in Mayan sites far from the coasts in the interior of the region. Despite Mesoamerica being a bit thinner than the rest of North America, finding shark bits in the interior of the Mayan-occupied region is pretty interesting. How did they import sharks all the way to the interior, so far away from the coasts and rivers where people may have hunted them? Sharks appear in indigenous Mesoamerican art in the first millennium BC all the way till the 15th century AD, though, owing to the aesthetic sensibilities of the region, they almost always appear stylized and exaggerated in their characteristics. Shark toofers have been found in many archaeological sites from the western Caribbean island of Cozumel to Panama and El Salvador in the east, and employed in iconography from Palenque in Chiapas, Mexico, to Lamanay in Belize. 
Clearly, the stories, images, and physical bits of sharks They'll capture the imagination of the entire planet. Enough to have traveled great distances. Shark stuff is kinda everywhere throughout the art and archaeology of Maya sites. You can find it in their symbols, their statues, their tools, jewelry, ceremonial stuff, and of course as just isolated teeth or severed jaws. All of this implies a close connection or relationship to sharks, as well as active hunting of the animals. They knew what sharks were and hunted them. This is even recounted by the Spanish who conquered the area. Sharks are different from other fish in lacking air bladders. I mean, they're also freaky different in having rubber skeletons. Well, you know, cartilage skeletons, but cartilage is rubbery, so I don't see the difference. They also have pointy scales made of teeth. That's a true fact, look it up. Sharks are crazy in a litany of different ways I won't get into here, but just know that sharks and the cartilaginous fishes are separated from all other fish by a vast amount of time and evolution. It's kind of a disservice to evolution to lump sharks, ray fin fish, and low fin fish into the category of fish, but I'd be digressing. Due to the lack of air bladder, sharks usually have to keep moving in order to remain buoyant. This also means they sink like rocks when they die. This makes them a pain in the ass to collect once you kill them. Of course, I don't condone the hunting of sharks today, but we're talking about ancient Maya people hunting them for food, and something tells me they were probably using every piece of those sharks, unlike the modern finning industry. Wonder if that's gonna get me pro finners in the comments section? Oh well. Hunting sharks without huge nets, trawlers, and modern equipment would have been difficult because of the lack of floating air bladders. That being said, the indigenous populations of Mesoamerica were incredibly ingenuitive, like every group of people always have been, and invented an incredibly smart way to catch the sharks they hunted so they could haul them aboard their boats and back home, and without the need for nets. Remoras. This method was recounted by none other than the son of despotic rat bastard Christopher Columbus, Hernando Colon. He wrote, Their manner of fishing was so strange and new to our men. They had tied some fishes they call reverso to the tail, which run themselves against other fish. And with a certain roughness, they have from the head to the middle of the back. They stick fast to the next fish they meet. And when the Indians perceive it, drawing their line, they hand them both in together. And we have seen them fasten upon fast sharks. Cool, huh? Obviously, there are more ways to retrieve your shark hole than remoras, and American archaeologist and diplomat to Yucatan, Edward Thompson, recollected his participation in one of these hunts in the late 1800s. The little canoe danced like a cork on troubled waters, responding lightly to jerking poles that would have been dangerous to a clumsier, heavier craft. The locals would embed big hooks in bait and then let the sharks go to town on it till they got plum tired. The fishermen would then haul them back to the boat and whack them over the head to death. I said before that I doubted the early Maya would waste the entire shark, but shark meat is kinda weird and requires some work to make edible, so I don't really know anything about how much they may have wasted and I doubt anyone might know since that is something that would have to be written down. I was just going on vibes, really. But considering that the later Spanish and Maya inhabitants of Yucatan would hunt sharks just for their teeth and liver oil, maybe the ancient Maya did similar. I don't know, but it would seem odd to idolize sharks to the degree that symbols, statues, and bits of shark are found in many Maya sites, only for them to waste 95% of the shark. Shark meat is weird because sharks have a high level of mercury in them, higher than other fish, and on top of that, their meat reeks of ammonia due to a high urea content and spoils quickly without processing. A common way to process the meat is by brining or marinating it for an extended period of time, which removes the urea and odor. But besides that, the meat is edible. After some rather brief searches, I cannot seem to find references to cooking shark meat without first processing it with some other ingredient. The reason you have to process it with acids, brines, or similar marinades is to remove the urea, but the urea builds up after death due to decay. So, I have to wonder if you could technically cook shark meat without the processing if you cooked it immediately after catching, killing, and butchering the shark. Of course, I personally think no one should be eating them at all due to their intelligence, rarity, and importance to the world's ocean ecosystems, but, you know, speaking hypothetically. 
the ancient Maya definitely would have had access to and knowledge of the same methods of processing shark meat that are used today. So if they didn't immediately cook it, they definitely would have processed it. Salting and drying the meat may have made it last long enough to take inland as far as bits of shark have been found, so perhaps that was the series of steps that brought the myths of the animals to places far from the ocean. Regardless of the methods by which sharks traveled inland, they did, literally and figuratively. Shark bits, like teeth and occasional vertebrae, are found in many sites across Mesoamerica, like Altanja, Caracol, Cerros, Cola, Cuello, La Manay, Luba Anton, and Mojo K of Belize, Chautuapa of El Salvador, El Zotz, Piedras Negras, Nebaj, and Tikal of Guatemala, Cozumel, Champoton, Chacambo, Chapa de Corzo, Isla Cerritos, Mayapan, Olmec site of El Manati, Palanque, Las Flores, Cerro de las Mesas, La Venta, and Plan de Ayutla of Mexico, Divala in Costa Rica, and Sitio Conte in Panama. The shark beats were found isolated in many sites but were also found incorporated into objects, inferring their significance. At the Olmec site of El Manati, a shark tooth was found embedded into a red cylindrical wooden baton or scepter. This one dates to 1700 to 1500 BC. The baton was found among offerings left at a natural spring. Another site dating to 100 to 380 in Chiapa de Corzo had a burial containing an obsidian lance that contained 56 shark teeth embedded in its shaft. Another lance was found with shark and other fish teeth embedded in it in a Panama site. These weaponary uses of shark teeth are uncommon, but a much more common use for teeth was as a buried offering. Lidded jars of teeth have been recovered in many sites. One particularly metaphorical example comes from a site in Blue Creek, Belize, from the early classic period, 250 to 550 CE. Archaeologists found a lidded vessel that has two bowls connected lip to lip. It was filled in successive levels to assumedly represent the cosmos, with the lowest level, the primordial sea, the next level being Earth, and the last level being the heavens. Many other caches of shark teeth have been found in other Maya archaeological sites. It is thought this was done as symbolic representations of the faraway mythic sea, as many other marine exotic bits and trinkets were left with the shark teeth and carved into objects. The process of doing this was a creative act in and of itself, as it showed a recreation of the cosmic original, a symbolic gesture. A creation myth detailed in Palenque's temple, 19, tells the formation of the heavens and the earth when a primordial sea monster opens its jaws and the ancient Maya who made the caches replicated the story. When you open them, it looks like a primordial sea monster opening its maw to create the universe, which is proxied here as the different layers of objects within the vessel. Now comes the prehistoric part of the story. The largest shark to ever live and one of the largest fish, Otodus megalodon, or simply megalodon, was very, very, very dead by the time humans, let alone the Maya, existed. The behemoths left the Earth about 3.6 million years ago, as evidenced by their fossil record, which stops at exactly the 3.6 million year mark, with no more fossils of the animals after. Remember though, that humans have been obsessed with fossils for our entire history, even before we truly understood what they belonged to. So the teeth of the mighty Megalodon have been unearthed and gawked at for a very long time. In the case of the ancient Maya, two offerings found at the temples at Palenque were that of the fossilized teeth of a Megalodon. Just to throw it in your face that Europeans were not the end-all be-all of ancient advancement, plenty of Renaissance folks thought the fossil Megalodon teeth were petrified tongues, while the Maya knew they were teeth. Which is weird since most of Europe is embroiled with the sea, which has plenty of endemic sharks, but I be digressing. Megalodon teeth are found basically worldwide, as it was so large it could travel around the world and probably had to be in order to get the amount of food it needed to live. Fossil teeth are therefore found throughout the Americas, so ancient paleontologists were likely finding these teeth either in the shallows a la modern East Coast North America, or through happenstance when they fell out of eroding rock faces inland. 
There have also been fossilized shark teeth uncovered at a site in Palenque with 13 teeth and 7 vertebrae as votive offerings beneath the floors of the temple at the site. These shark fossils have also been found in association with funerary contexts. The nearby site, Plan de Ayutla, housed a cache that included a megalodon tooth underneath a ball court. This is sort of where the megalodon involvement ends, but stay tuned. Shark teeth are found in many other sites with examples from nurse sharks and dusky sharks. They were intimately familiar with the shapes of sharks, as even with some of their offerings, they made stylized but anatomically accurate vases shaped like sharks to house them, like this vessel. It has large pectoral fins, a lid that has the large dorsal fin, and then you can see the smaller second dorsal fin and the tail. It also has its nostrils on the underside of the snout, as in real sharks. And this one even has fleshy barbells, recreated here to emulate the same things in the nurse shark. They included elements from sharks into their myths and legends. Look at this logograph. It is meant to represent the word for shark, or shuk. Many ancient Maya rulers incorporated shuk into their names to associate themselves with the powerful nature of the real animal and their semi-divine nature, as in Yosh Eb Zuk and Ishk Abal Shuk, First Step Shark and Lady Shark Fin, respectively. A site dated to the first millennium BC, located in San Lorenzo, contains a monument, Monument 63, which may represent an ancient version of a deeply rooted Mesoamerican legend. The Legend of Sipakli. The method details a battle between supernaturals to best a primordial shark monster to create the world. There's even this guy, an impersonator of the maze god, who wears the upper jaw of a shark over his groin. Some shark and mythical beast caricatures only have one big incisor tooth. The reason for this may be due to megalodon teeth. They are so much bigger than any other shark teeth and are found by themselves rather than in association with other teeth. Therefore, since they knew what sharks and their teeth looked like, it is not a stretch to think they incorporated the nature of the fossil teeth into their monsters as well. Like in this early classic-aged tetrapod plate showing a highly stylized shark with a single giant tooth in its jaws. If teeth of modern sharks were known to all of the Maya people, even those so far inland they never saw the ocean, then perhaps they also thought the megalodon teeth belonged to giant ocean-dwelling beasts that still roamed the world's oceans. In this way, the Maya may have been ahead of their time. They compared the fossil teeth to those of modern relatives and imagined what giant beasts they may have belonged to, whether in the past or still with them to that day. It would take almost a millennium for Europeans to figure that out. As a quick little insert, ancient Maya were not the only people to collect giant fossil shark teeth and think they were cool. Two fossil megalodon teeth were found at the Gravetian site, Pavlov 1, located in South Moravia, Czech Republic, and described back in 2011. The site dates to the Upper Paleolithic, so 50,000 to 12,000 years ago. Both of these teeth come from the Miocene, with the original Miocene sediments, the Carpathian Foredeep, or Vienna Basin, outcropping relatively close to the site. It makes the most sense, in this case, that the teeth eroded out of the rock layer and then the people found them. What's very interesting with these teeth is that they are asymmetrically worn down, meaning that the folks who found them decided to literally use them as tools for cutting. Obviously not as strong or good at cutting as fresh shark teeth, they were still clearly being put to good use. Humans will always be fascinated with the little knickknacks the Earth preserves. It's just a great thing they were preserved here in the first place. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons Arda, Bayer, Biotiverse, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Isaiah Garza, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus.
And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons, Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, The Dogman, 